you look at today's news, if you look at the world today, if you listen long enough to talk radio or whatever the media outlet is that you let time be invested into, it doesn't take much time to realize that there is great spiritual warfare in our nation. It doesn't take much time to realize that it seems like the world has gone mad. It seems like everybody's crazy. Am I right? Seems like everyone has just lost their mind. We all know the scripture in the book of Proverbs, chapter 23. The Bible says that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So we begin to see the world as it's playing out. And we think, man, these people have got to be just losing their mind. Sometimes I look at my wife and I say, Shanna, you and I are the only two normal people left. <laughs> you've, you've done that before, haven't you? Everyone else around me is completely crazy. I don't know what is going on with the world. Can anyone in this place say amen? Everything is just upside down. And I have a question that I've been asking. What are they thinking? What are they thinking? What in the world is everyone around me thinking right now? So I got a message for you this morning. Will you throw up that title screen for me? What are you thinking? Father, I thank you that you've given me this opportunity to hold this microphone in this house of these great pastors that I so love. You gave me a specific assignment for today, and I just pray that you would anoint these lips, circumcise my ear to be able to hear what you want me to say, and do what you want me to do. And everyone in the house said, amen. Life is choice driven. You choose, then you get results. Nobody ever said, I want to be a millionaire, did nothing, and then one day became a millionaire. You have to decide, and then you have to act. If you want to own a business, you have to decide what you want to do, set up a business plan, follow that model, and then you see results. The place where we are right now is a determining factor of what we have been thinking. If you can look at your life right now, I promise you, you can go back a few months, a few years, and you can already, you can, you can say, I once thought about where this place is at. You can't wish yourself into success. A lot of people do that. You cannot wish yourself into success, but life is choice-driven, and choices are a byproduct of your thinking. Yesterday, my wife and I, a couple months ago, purchased tickets to Kings Island, and we bought those fast passes so we could pass everybody in line. We were going with a bunch of people. My wife is not a fan of roller coasters or anything like that. She doesn't even like a swing. She's not into the amusement crowd. <laughs> So we spent hundreds of dollars on this stuff months ago, and it was non-refundable. Well, you all live here, so you saw what yesterday was like, right? There's a monsoon. It rained from morning to night, and it never stopped. So we, we were trying to make these plans. Are we going? Are we going? Are we going? Some of the people still went. We woke up in the morning. I'm like, Shanna, I know we spent hundreds and hundreds of dollars on this stuff. And I hate to say it, but I don't know if... If we can go. I was like, I know I can handle it, but I don't think you can. <laughs> she got the curly hair, so when the water hits it, it goes. Pfft. Some of you women know what that's like. So we made the decision, well, and she helped push it, that we weren't going to Kings Island yesterday, and I wasted my money. And in my thought process, I'm thinking, how many hours did I have to work to pay for these tickets that we're not even going to use? That's how men think. And my wife's thinking, man, my hair still looks good. <laughs> that's how women think. I'm upset about the fact that I'm not going to Kings Island and she's excited about the fact that we're not going to two totally separate ways of thought. Because I look at a roller coaster and I think, yes, this is awesome. I can't wait to get on this thing. She looks at it and thinks, this is sure death. Same roller coaster, same place, same amount of money, different ways of thinking. You see how thinking shapes the way you go in your life? Thinking is very, very important. Your thoughts dictate your direction. They either thrust you toward your destiny or they thwart you away from it. Jesus has a lot to say about thoughts. When I started putting this message together, I just <laughs> I started searching verses on thinking and thoughts. And there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of verses. Your Bible is full of things in the Old Testament and in the New Testament about your thought life. And I chose this verse right here. Matthew 22, verses 34 through 37 in the New King James Version. The Bible says this. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. 
Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. We've been seeing a lot of lawyers testing people. Testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your mind. So I started reading into this verse, and I got beyond the surface level because that's how you study the Bible. You don't just read it. You study and you go deep into it. I started looking at the words in the Greek. And the Greek word for the word soul is the word suke, which is where we get the word psych or psyche. The word soul basically means your mind, your will, and your, emo your emotions. So Jesus is looking at the teachers of the law and the lawyers, and he says, the number one thing that you have to do is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all of your mind, and with all of your mind. Soul means mind. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, and with all of your mind. He said it twice. It's so important to him the way you think that he said the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, and with all of your mind. And I was taught very early in Bible study that any time in the Bible when you see something twice, when Jesus says, verily, verily, I say unto you, you better pay attention. Because that means it's something important. You, when you were younger, you knew when your mom said your name, she, my mom would say, Mike, Mike, Michael Craig Lamb. I knew it was time. You know what I mean? Because we didn't have timeouts in my house. Can anyone say amen? We had a belt in my house. And I was a, I love my mom, but I feared her. And I knew that when she said my name that last time, that, oh, I had to pay attention. Well, that's what this is saying. Anytime you see that in the scripture, it means pay attention. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all of your mind, and with all of your mind. See, it started at the beginning. Adam was placed into a garden. There were tree, two trees in the garden. One was called the tree of life, and one was called the tree of knowledge. God said you can eat from the tree of life all that you want, but do not touch the tree of knowledge. That is not for you. And the enemy somehow got into the mind of the woman and convinced her to partake of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. And then she convinced her husband. And ever since then, there's been an epidemic in the mind of men. The enemy said, if you take of this tree, you will be like God. He was offering them something they already had, but he said, you'll even think like he thinks. So since the fruit was partaken, men have been thinking totally differently. Our thought life is very important. A.W. Tozer, one of the greatest scholars of all time, said this, Anyone who wishes to check on their true spiritual condition may do so by noting what his thoughts have been over the last hours and over the last days. You want to check your spirit? What have you been thinking? Where have your thoughts been? Have you been meditating on the word, meditating on the one seated on the throne like we did this morning? Or have your problems been overwhelming you a little bit more than what your faith has been pushing you? What are you thinking? How is your thinking? When Adam partook of that fruit, a seed was planted into the mind of man. And now man is born. He is born with that seed implanted into his thinking. And he thinks totally different. He thinks different than what God's plan was for him. I'm not going to preach this morning. I'm going to teach because I just got a specific assignment to come into this place this morning and expose some things that have been planted into your mind. When Adam ate from the tree, the enemy's target was not his body, although his body eventually did decay because of it. When Adam ate from the tree, the target was not his spirit, although it did cause separation from God. When Adam ate from the tree, the target was the soul of men. The enemy had the soul of men, your mind, your will, and your emotions in his crosshairs. And he said, if I can just penetrate the armor of their mind, I can have full access to everything about them. If he can just find one crack in the shield of your mind, he can have access to your way of thinking. And when he accesses your thinking, he can dictate the direction of which you're supposed to go. 
And many people today are living in a place where they are not dictating where they want to go, but the enemy has gotten in. A spiritual warfare has come against him. I know we're facing it in the nation, but many people are sitting in pews every week and facing it every single day. What are you thinking? I feel the spirit in this house this morning. 1 Thessalonians 5, chapter 23, or verse 23, I'm sorry, New King James Version. The Bible says this. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I could teach you for day upon day upon day, week after week after week, On the topic of the body, the soul, and the spirit. You are a triune being. You were made in the image of God. And the way that God is Father, Son, and Spirit, you are body, soul, and spirit. The enemy decided to target not your body, not your spirit, but he wanted to target your soul. The body responds to the environment or to your flesh. If you walk outside this morning, your body is going to realize it's getting wet. And then it's going to get cold. So you put a sweater on. Last week it was 93 degrees and I was sweating like crazy. Today I put on a sweater because my body told me it was cool. Your body responds to the environment. Your spirit responds to God. Whatever God says goes into your spirit and your spirit pulls you toward God. So it's like a tug of war between the two. The body, the flesh, the spirit, God. And right there in the middle is the soul or the mind of men. And the soul and the mind of men responds to your thinking or your thought life. Well, explain it to me. Okay, how does man get saved? How does man receive salvation? Repentance, right? They teach this in the Sprouts class. If you'll just, re- if you'll just repent of your sins and accept Jesus into your heart, you, you can be saved. That's how man gets saved. The word saved in the Greek is the word metanoia. And a lot of times people think that getting saved is changing your actions. That's not it. The word metanoia means to change your way of thinking. A man receives salvation not by changing his actions, but by changing his thoughts. What are you thinking? Thinking is important to God. Because your thought life dictates what your destiny is. Whether you're going to spend destiny in hell or if you're going to spend destiny in paradise with him. So I could tell you this morning, your thought life is very, very important. Romans chapter 7 verse 25 in the New King James, the Bible says this. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, so then with the mind... So then with my thinking, I myself serve the law of God. The Bible says that we serve God with our mind. You see how important it is to have your thinking right? It's one of the most important things a Christian can do. Oh, it's it's important to not sin. Absolutely. The church said, we got enough sinning in the church. Maybe that's why his kingdom ain't been coming. I'm going to touch that. But the most important thing you can do is have your thought life right. And many people every single week in the pew come to church week after week after week after week with no change. They see no change. They see a man on the stage that looks like he has everything put together, everything perfect, and in their life they're in absolute turmoil. This morning you're not looking at a man that's had a perfect life. I'll tell you, a few years ago I was at World Harvest Church, Pastor Rod Parsley. And I was sitting in the middle of Dominion Camp Meeting. And right in the middle of Dominion Camp Meeting, when my mind should have been on God and worshiping, I practically had an anxiety attack. Oh, the stage has problems? Yes, we do. We're human. I don't even know where it came from, but all of a sudden my chest tightened up. I'm like, what is going on here? I, I don't have fear of people. I speak in front of people. I play music in front of people every week. And all of a sudden, I feel this anxiety and I feel this attack come on me. Listen, nobody is above attack of the enemy. And the more I dwelled on that anxiety, the worse it got. And the more I thought about it, the, the, the less I could breathe, the less oxygen I felt like I had in my lungs. And before I knew it, I was full-blown panic attack mode in the middle of a church. 
because I allowed something to penetrate my thought life. There are too many people around me I didn't know, and I was distracted, and I was pulled in every single way, and I was, everything, was, everything was just crazy. You see, the soul and the mind is the teetering point between the desires of the flesh and the desire of the spirit. It's a teetering point, and the way you think determines what way that that thing's going to teeter. Think the wrong thoughts, you go the wrong direction. Think the right thoughts, you go the right direction. And many of us live on what seems like a boat in the ocean of left to right to left to right, never finding the right way to go because we've never found the right way of thinking. What are you thinking? I know I'm not preaching the house down, but I'm on assignment this morning. What are you thinking? And we're stuck in this tug of war. And I call, every time I'm here, I probably talk about it. I call it divine frustration. I'm so frustrated because I know, I know I'm supposed to be here. I know that I have potential to be here. I know the Spirit's saying that I'm called to do this. But I know that the flesh is saying, you can't do that. You don't have the ability to do that. You're not qualified to do that. Those men have doctorate degrees. You don't have that. You can't hold that mic up. So it's a constant tug of war, but the Spirit's saying, I've called you. I've chosen you. I've set you apart. I've called you to preach to the nation. I called you to revive a generation. And then your mind's saying, yeah, but you're just a country boy that don't really have much of an education. You're just a painter. You don't even, you don't even know what you're talking about. And it's a tug of war in your mind. And many of you are facing that this morning, or I would not have this assignment. You're facing this tug of war and a pull because the Spirit is drawing you. The Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And your thinking is dictating which way you're going. I feel the Spirit. Your body's relaying on outside information while your spirit's relying on inside revelation. And both of them are teetering and pulling and tugging at one another. And it's like we've become schizophrenic. Which way do I go? Which way? You see, ever seen a squirrel? A squirrel has no idea what they're doing. They're... And most Christians today are the same way. I, I, I don't know. I don't know which way. To, I don't know which way. To, well, I think. I, I, and we become schizophrenic. Your body's relying on past experiences while your spirit is relying on future endeavors. And we're stuck somewhere in the middle. Stuck. Our minds are being pulled every single direction. Spiritual schizophrenia. Romans chapter 7, verses 19 through 24. In the New King James, the Bible says this. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. This is Paul speaking. But the evil I will not do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find in a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, in my body, warring against the law of my mind. And bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my member. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Even Paul, who wrote one third of the New Testament, had this problem. He said, I want to do what, listen to it, it sounds schizophrenic. I want to do what I want to do, but I can't do what I want to do because when I'm doing something, I want to do something else and doing something I don't want to do. That's what Paul said. That's pretty much. I want to do something I don't know. I don't do. And we see this great man of God, and he's got an issue. <laughs> Uh, most uh, psychiatrists probably say, lock this guy up. Uh, put a straight jacket on him because he's crazy. Listen, I do what I do, and something's telling me to do something I don't want to do, but inside I want to do it, and then I don't want to do it. There's people in the room today that say, inside I want to do something, but my outside won't let me. There's people in the room today that said, the outside's pulling at me to do something. The inside's telling me I want to do something else. And, and I, 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 Oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to save me? Who's going to deliver me from this body of death? Who's going, to, who's going to get me out of this? The greatest battle that you and I face in our Christian life is not by an outside enemy. It's by the enemy between our two ears. The enemy of our thoughts. I'm preaching to somebody this morning. There's an epidemic in the mind. Don't believe me? A man named Anthony Bourdain. Many of you probably have his cookbooks. Many of you probably watched him on the Food Network. 
This year, he recently committed suicide because there's an epidemic in the mind. Not that he didn't have money, not that he didn't have influence, but because there's an epidemic in the mind. There's a woman, probably 50% of this room is carrying some of her product, Kate Spade, my wife and Pastor Carol's favorite designer. <laughs> I think Judy's too. Many of you are carrying her product. She had great influence in the world, all the money she wanted, high-rise, penthouse. This year she committed suicide because there's an epidemic in the mind. A pastor in California this month had what seemed like is the goal for every 30-year-old man that's called to the ministry. Thousands attending a church that was already paid for every week. Looked like he had success in ministry. And he still pulled the trigger. Because there's an epidemic in the mind. If we do not deal with the epidemic, the foundation level, we can never build what he wants to build. There's an epidemic in the mind of men. And I came to Oasis this morning to ask every person in this room, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? The mind is your battlefield. Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 7. I'm throwing a lot of scripture at you, but there's hundreds to choose from, so I just chose a few. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and, what's that word? Peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Carnally and spiritually minded men. And then it's enmity against God. You know what that means? It just battles against God all day long. Is your mind battling against God's plan for you all day long? Is your mind battling constantly saying, I, can't, I just can't do this. I just can't be that person. I can't, I can't get off of that thing. I can't release that addiction. I cannot get away from that thought pattern. I can't never get out of poverty because I was raised this way. What is your mind telling you about your future? Because one of them is an enemy with God. If your thoughts are not aligned with his word, then your thought is an enemy of God. Anxiety is a tool that the enemy uses to make you not see in perspective. I was in the house the other day, okay? Shanna came home from work, and I heard the garage door go up like it always does. She pulled in. And I waited a minute, and she didn't come in the door. What is going on out there? She must be on the phone, some kind of business or something. Still didn't come in. And I'm thinking, I'm going to go there and check on her. And then my phone rang, and it says Shanna. I'm like, she's in the garage. What is going on? Pastor Tim told me he did that to you before from, the, from his man cave. Called, called Pastor Carol. Hey, can you bring me water down here? Get it yourself. She called, me, she called me from the garage. I'm like, what is she thinking? She called me. She said, you better get out here right now. I'm like, what's wrong? The car going to explode or what? What's going on? She goes, there is a spider out here that is the biggest spider I've ever seen in my life. I can't get out of my car. I'm thinking, what in the world? We had this place sprayed. There, there can't be nothing that big. I'm not coming in until you come out here and you kill this gigantic spider. I said, Shannon, how big is it? She's like the size of a softball. It's the biggest thing I've ever seen. So I didn't grab my flip-flop. I grabbed a boot. I said, if I'm killing this thing, I ain't going to let it get away, okay? Because I'm as afraid of spiders as she is. I just ain't going to say it because I'm a man. I ain't put no spider on me. So I grabbed the boot, okay, and I walked out there with the boot being the big man. I said, okay, where's the spider at? She said, she's inside of her car. It's on the wall. She won't even roll the window down. <laughs> it's on the wall. I look up. Where? Right there beside that water. Beside that water bottle. Right there. I looked down, and the spider was this big. The size of a quarter. I said, are you kidding me? Come out here and kill the spider. She said, I'm not doing it. I said, do it. I'm not doing it. Do it. She said, I'm not even playing, Mikey. I'm not playing. I'm not going to kill this spider. I said, okay, before I, before I get in trouble here, I'm going to kill this spider. So I just killed the little spider. What she saw was a gigantic spider. What I saw was a little tiny thing. It's not the size of the spider. It's the size of the spider in your mind. That's deep. She saw something that absolutely terrorized her thought life. And I saw something that was easily smashable. Probably couldn't even have a big enough my, uh, mouth to bite me with. <laughs> and she was freaking out. What small thing have you seen enlarged in your thought pattern to the point where it's freaking you out? It's just a little small thing. Man, you feel that in the room? 
It's just a little small thing. And you've dwelled on it for so long that that little small thing's become magnetized and magnified and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then it covers your entire sight picture and it's all you see. She would have stayed in that car the rest of her life. If somebody didn't come out there and kill that spider because it's all she could think about. What are you thinking? What are you thinking? First scripture I read called God, the God of peace. We read scripture after scripture, God of peace, God of peace, God of peace. Then we read scripture after scripture of Jesus, the Prince of Peace, Prince of Peace, Prince of Peace. Then we read about the Holy Spirit. They call him the Spirit of Peace. All this peace is available to us. Why are many of us living in anxiety? Why is it that most of us are living in anxiety when all of this peace is available? That's like you having an entirely full bank account and starving to death. You've got a bank account full of peace with a check that's been signed. And he says, just spend however much you need on that peace. And you're still not using it because you're not accessing it. You're, you're glorifying other things instead of the God of peace. You're glorifying the anxiety instead of the Prince of Peace. You're glorifying the depression instead of the Spirit of Peace. Even though it's still available to you. You see, the mind has two basic features. It can either recall the past or imagine the future. The problem is that many people are stuck in their past. Stuck in their past failures. Stuck in their past defeats. Stuck in their past hurt. Stuck in their past pain. Stuck in their past shame. Stuck in their past wrongdoing. Stuck in their past injustices. Stuck in their past abuse. And every night they're going into a bed carrying something with them. They may be sleeping eight hours, but they're not getting a single minute of rest. You ever been in bed like that? You go to bed and the clock says you were there for eight hours, but when you woke up, you're just as tired as you were when you... Many people do that every day. You ever woke up in the bed soaking wet with sweat? Like you fought something in the middle of the night because your, your mind has gone a million miles a, der, a minute. And, and, and you're fighting something from your past. You're just locked in this place of your past because a lock has been placed on the outside door of your thinking. And you're stuck in this little room of your past. When you have the ability to live in the vast universe of your imagination, you're living a life stuck in this little closet of your past. And many times it's not even something you did, something your father did, something your uncle did, something traumatic that happened to you and you're stuck there. Time after time after time, people get stuck there. Are you stuck? Are you stuck today in a place in your past that's, that's keeping you from going forward into your future? Are you stuck today in that molestation? Are you stuck today in that rape? Are you stuck today in that miscarriage? Are you stuck today in that hurtful thought? Are you stuck today in that racism? Are you stuck today in that adversity that came against you? Are you stuck in something that's prohibiting you from going where you're supposed to go? Stopping you from imagining a future that God has for you. Your mind is supposed to be the factory of your future, not the prison of your past. That's a tweetable moment. Your mind is supposed to be the factory of your future, not the prison of your past. And many of us are locked in the chains every single day. I've been there. Told you I didn't live a perfect life. I can stand on this stage and say that my natural father was a minister on a stage, but a predator at the home. I'm being vulnerable with you today. He knew how to move a crowd on a stage, but when he got home, he was a predator. And his victims were people that were weak, young people, children. And I saw a man fake on a stage and come home and be a totally different person. And then I felt the call to preach, and I said, I'm not going to be that. I cannot be that. I can't be one of those minister people. I can't be one of those fake people 
I went to church my whole life and I thought every one of them was fake because my dad was fake. He was different when we got home. He was a different person. One time me and him got into a theology debate when I was a teenager and he picked up a cup of hot coffee and threw it on me. He said, you want to go to hell? That's what it feels like. I didn't have a perfect life. And I got trapped in that past way of thinking. I can't go there because I was this way. That happened to me when I was a child. I can't do that. And there are, there are a, lot of people, a lot of people in this room today that have been trapped in that same place that I was. Trapped in that same pain of your past. This, that, that, this is not in my notes. This is the Holy Spirit. Listen, that past thing that's been bogging you down, today, today, with the key of David, I open that door over you. There's no reason for you to stay in that place any longer. That past hurt cannot and will not have authority over your thinking. I decree over you tonight, today, that even now, the key is being placed inside of a lock and the lock's being opened right now in this room. we got to change our way of thinking. You know how easy it is for someone to... Uh, Change the way you think. It's pretty easy. Uh, can you throw up that first word that I sent you this morning? The nut word. Okay, this is my favorite nut. The word starts with the word Mac, right? Mac, what's that word? Come on, say it loud. Come on, participate one more time. What's that word? Mac Adamia. That's my favorite nut. Okay. I'm a fan of, uh, of, uh, of this next product. It's a food it also starts with the word mac. It's the word macaroni. Anyone else like macaroni in this place? Come on, raise your hands. Yeah. If you like it, go to City Barbecue. Best in the world. I promise you that. Take advice from this chubby guy. City Barbecue macaroni. And then I carry a phone in my pocket. An iPhone. It's made by Apple, but the senior company is another word called mac. Come on, say it. All right, throw up that next word. Oh, you only have three? Well, that messed me up. Okay, there's another word spelled M-A-C. What's that? And then the last four words are H-I-N-E. What's that? Hein, right? I was going to have you read the word Mac Hein. But really the word was machine. It's an easy way to change your way of thinking. Because the first few started with Mac, you automatically think Mac Hine, when in, in reality it's machine. I saw another preacher use that one time. I said, i got to use that here today. Unfortunately, I messed it up. But in, in 10 seconds, I can change your way of thinking by making you think about the past words you just said. Macadamia, Macintosh, Macaroni, Mac Hine. No, everyone in this world knows that that's machine. I just changed the way you were thinking. And that's what's happening to you every single day when you turn on that TV. They're trying to alter the way you think. That's why they're placing scenarios in TV shows of two husbands trying to think, change the way you think. Placing the scenario of, of evolution into the children's uh, science class because they're trying to change the way you think. Trying to create these crazy ideas of socialism into the college classroom. Trying to change the way a generation thinks. And they're being successful because they're penetrating the armor of the mind. And the direction of our country is changing because our thought pattern is changing. David one time was sent to give some cheese to his brothers on the battlefield. And on the battlefield, he hears Goliath on the other mountain across the way just talking bad about his God. And David said, <laughs> You ain't talking bad about my God. He said, I'll go up and I'll fight against this guy. And every, all, these, all the warriors are like, Psh, you're a little boy. What do you mean you're going to fight a giant? We're scared of this guy. What do you mean? Look, you need, you need to think like we're thinking. This guy is going to kill everybody. They're going to own all of Israel. And David's like, I don't think like that. That's not how I think. Well, you're going to die today then. David said, no, nah, I'm not going to die today. You see why? Because one time I killed a lion with my hands. One time I killed a bear with my hands. See, he thought of his past victories, not his past defeats. He didn't think about that time when his brother 
uh, said, you're not worthy to be king, I am, look at me. When his dad didn't even think he was worthy to be anointed by the prophet to be king, he could have dwelled on that and said, oh, I'm just an old shepherd boy. No, listen, he took his past victory. He said, I killed a lion and I killed a bear. And today, he used his imagination, today I will hold the head of this uncircumcised Philistine. He saw it in his imagination and then it made it happen in his mind. And then he took a rock and a sling and he hit the giant and he fell. The Bible said he walked up to the giant, took the giant's sword and decapitated him and held his head walked into town with his head. And then the women sang, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. And he immediately got a following because he used his past victory to create an imagination for him to walk in. You can use your past victories for an imagination or you can use your past defeat to keep you locked in to something that you'll be locked in the rest of your life. Which one do you want to go into? You want to stay in your past or do you want to go into your future? I'm preaching this morning. Do you want to stay with where you are or do you want to go where God's got for you that was the first step of David walking into the kingship when he imagined what he could do with his mind either you can dwell on your past or you can see your future if you can beat it in your head you can beat it in your life if you got a problem in your life if you can beat it first right here you can beat it there. That's why coaches study tapes and they say, oh, this is what they're going to do. This is what they're going to do. So let's put together a game plan. And then if this game plan goes together successfully, we will win. Happens every week, every Saturday in college sports, every Sunday if you're still watching the NFL. They put together a plan and then they win because of their way of thinking. I'm trying to close this thing out here. You don't have to remain where you are. There is a key out of the prison of your past. There is a prescription for your mind. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, in the Passion Translation. The Bible says this. Stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed or transfigured by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation and renewing of your mind and how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in his eyes. you got to renew your mind. No more broken mind. Renewed means almost just like new. Every day you should renew your mind. Every single day you need to renew your mind. You know why? Because Jesus isn't the only thing that resurrects. That's why the Bible says that his mercy is new every morning. Every day, that seed that Adam placed into your head, it's like a weed and it resurrects. And every day, you've got to go to the garden of your mind and pluck out that weed. Every single day, Adam's seed has to be plucked out of your mind. Every single day. At the beginning of this year, in the spring, I decided I wanted all of my mulch beds to look really pretty, really nice, really beautiful. So me and Shannon took a day off work, and instead of paying someone to do it, I said, we'll do it ourselves. So I bought all the product that you put down to make sure and ensure that there are no weeds in your mulch beds. Many of you men are like me, and you're obsessive-compulsive. And one little weed, I'm like freaking out. So I put the preen down. You probably all bought that. Preen down, that's supposed to guarantee that you don't have any weeds. And then I put down the little uh, batten that goes over top of it so no weeds can break through the, and penetrate. Then I put about eight inches of mulch everywhere. I mean, like, pfft, tons of mulch. There's more, my mulch is higher than my grass. It sticks up like this high. <laughs> I want you to see it from the road. So I put all that stuff down, and then I got this uh, product that's called uh, Roundup 365. Guarantees your weeds are gone for an entire year. And I sprayed it all over all my mulch everywhere. Just, I sprayed so much at it, my grass died around the edge of my mulch bed. Because <laughs> I didn't want no weeds in that stuff. And it looked amazing for about a month. But because I stopped going out there and stopped caring so much, I walked outside and there's a little weed back here by my flower bed. And then a little weed over here. And right now, because I've been so busy, listen, I, I, I've never been so busy in my entire life as I am right now. I see my wife about 30 minutes a day. We're so busy. I walked into the sidewalk the other day. I usually go through the garage so I don't see my mulch beds. I walked through the sidewalk the other day, and it's like weeds everywhere. That stuff's a lie. It didn't keep no weeds out. It detained them for a minute, but they still found a way in. 
Just like all of your mulch beds at home, you all got weeds everywhere. Your neighbors hate you. Homeowners Association sending you letters. Get the weeds out of your mulch beds. <laughs> That's where I'm at right now. It was beautiful at the beginning of the year. Today it looks like garbage because I haven't put the time in daily to pluck those weeds. Many of you are the same place spiritually because if you don't pluck that weed out every single day, it's going to grow and overtake everything. And that thing that was once beautiful and perfect in his eyes is now filled with weeds just like my mulch bed. Is there anyone in the room that could say, right now my mulch bed does not look exactly like it should in my mind? Anybody in the room today that say there's been some weeds that have penetrated the surface? Maybe you couldn't see them at first, but there's some weeds there, and they're overtaking every <sighs> Man, his spirit's in this room. There's some weeds that have been coming through the surface of my mind, and I need to pluck those things out today because the one-time preen and the one-time roundup did not work. I got to do this every single day. I got, I got to do it. Paul said it like this. I have to die daily. Every day I got to kill myself and I got to crucify myself every single day because if I miss a day, I'm probably going to fall backwards. If you get lazy in your walk, I'm promising you today, if you grow lazy and lackadaisical in your walk, weeds will come and take over. And before you realize it, a thing that was once beautiful will look terrible. Do you feel his presence in this room? He wants to speak to you today about those weeds. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 6. Can you come help me, Rachel? The Bible says this, For although we live in the natural realm, we don't wage a military campaign employing human weapons, using manipulation to achieve our aims. Instead, our spiritual weapons are energized with divine power to effectively dismantle the defenses behind which people hide. We can demolish every deceptive fantasy that opposes God. And break through every arrogant attitude that is raised up in defiance of the true knowledge of God. We capture, I love this part right here. We capture like prisoners of war every thought and insist that it bow down in obedience to the anointed one. Oh, that is some good reading right there. Since we are armed with such dynamic weaponry, we stand ready to punish any trace of rebellion. As soon as you choose complete obedience. Isn't that an amazing scripture? That's an incredible scripture. You have every single tool necessary in your arsenal to live life abundantly. Every single tool. All you got to do is use it daily. So I have a question to ask everyone in the room. As the music begins. What's been limiting you? What's been holding you back? What's had you tied down? What is it that is limiting you? Who told you that you have limits? It wasn't him. The Bible says I can do all things through Christ. No, no limits. No boundary. I can do everything, but my mind tells me, what is it that's limiting you? Do you remember when Adam took of that fruit? The Bible said that he killed an animal and he made a covering for himself. And God came down there and said, what are you doing, Adam? Where are you? And he said, I'm naked. Remember this? God looked at him and said, who told you you were naked? I never said you were naked. I never put that limit on you. Your way of thinking put that limit on you. Who told you that? Well, my mind said that I was naked. I'm limited. I, can't, I, I have to cover. I'm limited. But the scripture says this. It says that he can do exceeding and abundantly above all we could ever what? Ask or the only thing that's been limiting you is your thinking. So my question for the day, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? Stand to your feet in the room.
you feel the somber presence of the Lord today. The God of peace has walked into this room. He's come to declare liberty to the captives. He come to set free those that are in prison. He came to declare the opening of the prison doors to those who are bound. Come on, today if you can say, Mikey, this word was for me. There is weeds in my mind that have not allowed me to go where I'm supposed to. Limits that I've placed here. I want you to shoot your hand up all over this room. Come on, everywhere in this room. Come on, everywhere in this room. Limits on your mind. Chains on what you're doing. Come on. Your way of thinking has put you where you are right now. And he came today to shift your way of thinking. Woo! I feel the spirit in the room this morning with the key to open up every single lock, to shut every door and to open every access point. Today I feel the spirit saying, I've called you up here. I've called you to another level. I've called you to do what I told you to do. And today permission is granted. Woo! Come on, pluck out every weed. Come on, repent. Metanoia, change your way of thinking. Lord, we repent for our way of thinking. We repent for the thinking that has caused us to be where we are. We repent for the limit that we placed on our own mind and on our own thoughts. Today we pluck up everything that's not like you and we set our mind on things above. Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are thought worthy, Lord, today we think upon these things. We say we will achieve our destiny. We will be who you called us to be. We will not be locked in the prison of our past. We will dwell in the factory of our future. Come on, somebody. Come on, he's here. He's here. He's here. The chain breaker is here. The key holder is here. The one who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever is here. Just allow him to do that work. You don't have to come to an altar. Right where you are, just allow him to work on that thing. Just confess to him with your mouth what it is. That molestation that held me down, God, today I confess no more. Past defeat, I say no more. I decree over you, no more will you be stuck. I decree no more will Oasis be stuck. There is a future, says the Lord. There is a tomorrow. Today is not the end. Yesterday was not your best. I say that the thing that has been capturing you and had you bound for years, today is open. You are no longer stuck. You are no longer refined to a certain position. But I say my position for you is ahead, not behind. The enemy of your soul would try to bind you in your past, but I've loosed you into your future. Future ways of thinking. Future ways of acting. Future ways of going into what I've called you to. There are no limits, says the Lord. Come on, if you believe that, come come on, if you believe that, put your hands together on that word.